Indigenous Australians are descended from the original occupants of Australia. Academics are still debating whether these earliest migrations involved one or numerous waves and separate peoples, as well as their date. 40,000 to 43,000 years BP is the most frequently accepted time bracket for the existence of people in Australia, but 60,000 to 70,000 years BP is supported by others. However, this migration took place at a time when sea levels were significantly lower than they are now, during the concluding phases of the Pleistocene period. Sea levels dropped by 100 to 150 metres as a result of many bouts of prolonged glaciation. Since Australia and New Guinea were an unified landmass, known as Sahul, the continental coastline stretched considerably farther into the Timor Sea than it does now, and the two countries were linked together by a vast land bridge over the Arafura Sea and the Gulf of Carpentaria. Aboriginal people of Australia have been in existence for a long time, with many of the continent's indigenous peoples continuing to thrive. Approximately 10,000 years ago, as sea levels rose towards the end of the most recent glacial era, the Australian continent was once again divided into two different landmasses. There was still cultural exchange and trade between New Guinea and the northern Cape York Peninsula via the newly established 150-kilometre-wide Torres Strait with its series of islands. Around 120,000 Southern Asian migrants came to Australia in the 1970s and 1980s. These two decades saw Australia begin to embrace multiculturalism as a policy, coined by Immigration Minister Al Grass. The number of new immigrants in Australia increased by 40% in 2004-05 compared to the previous decade. Point one nine in the years 2004-2005, Sydney had the biggest influx of immigrants, numbering more over 40,000. China and India accounted for the vast bulk of those arriving in the United States. Indigenous Australians are descended from the original occupants of Australia. Academics are still debating whether these earliest migrations involved one or numerous waves and separate peoples, as well as their date. 40,000 to 43,000 years BP is the most frequently accepted time bracket for the existence of people in Australia, but 60,000 to 70,000 years BP is supported by others. However, this migration took place at a time when sea levels were significantly lower than they are now, during the concluding phases of the Pleistocene period. Sea levels dropped by 100 to 150 metres as a result of many bouts of prolonged glaciation. Since Australia and New Guinea were an unified landmass, known as Sahul, the continental coastline stretched considerably farther into the Timor Sea than it does now, and the two countries were linked together by a vast land bridge over the Arafura Sea and the Gulf of Carpentaria. Aboriginal people of Australia have been in existence for a long time, with many of the continent's indigenous peoples continuing to thrive. Approximately 10,000 years ago, as sea levels rose towards the end of the most recent glacial era, the Australian continent was once again divided into two different landmasses. There was still cultural exchange and trade between New Guinea and the northern Cape York Peninsula via the newly established 150-kilometre-wide Torres Strait with its series of islands. Around 120,000 Southern Asian migrants came to Australia in the 1970s and 1980s. These two decades saw Australia begin to embrace multiculturalism as a policy, coined by Immigration Minister Al Grass. The number of new immigrants in Australia increased by 40% in 2004-05 compared to the previous decade. Point one nine in the years 2004-2005, Sydney had the biggest influx of immigrants, numbering more over 40,000. China and India accounted for the vast bulk of those arriving in the United States. The goal for a lot of tech companies today, figure out what you, their customer, want next, before you even ask. It's driven by something called similarity search. If you go to YouTube and you watch a video they're going to suggest similar videos to the one you're watching. That's similarity search. If you go to Amazon and look for similar products to the one you're going to buy, that's similarity search. Sakit Navlaka, a computer scientist at the Salk Institute, 
He says, we do similarity searches, too, for example, when we scan faces in a crowd for the one we know. And even fruit files do a version, related to smell, so the fly is having to solve a similar problem, of kind of searching through its database of previous experiences and previous odors that it has smelled, to determine what should be the most appropriate behavioral response to that odor. But flies tag incoming odors differently from the way modern search algorithms pass similarity. A small group of neurons makes an initial evaluation of the smell. Then a much larger set of neurons is activated to make a final decision about the smell. Rather than the way a computer similarity search does it, taking something with many dimensions, and simplifying it down to a few. So Navlaka and his colleagues tweaked computer similarity search functions to do it fly style. And then pitted the fly-inspired algorithms against conventional ones. And the biologically inspired code won out better at telling, like from, unlike, on an image similarity test. You know evolution figured it out, it figured out a very elegant solution to this very important problem. The report is in the journal Science. Navlaka says he and his team are looking to partner with tech companies now, in hopes of endowing machines with the time-tested problem-solving abilities of the brain. Even if it's a fruit fly brain. The goal for a lot of tech companies today, figure out what you, their customer, want next, before you even ask. It's driven by something called similarity search. If you go to YouTube and you watch a video they're going to suggest similar videos to the one you're watching. That's similarity search. If you go to Amazon and look for similar products to the one you're going to buy, that's similarity search. Sakit Navlaka, a computer scientist at the Salk Institute. He says, we do similarity searches, too, for example, when we scan faces in a crowd for the one we know. And even fruit files do a version, related to smell, so the fly is having to solve a similar problem, of kind of searching through its database of previous experiences and previous odors that it has smelled, to determine what should be the most appropriate behavioral response to that odor. But flies tag incoming odors differently from the way modern search algorithms pass similarity. A small group of neurons makes an initial evaluation of the smell. Then a much larger set of neurons is activated to make a final decision about the smell. Rather than the way a computer similarity search does it, taking something with many dimensions, and simplifying it down to a few. So Navlaka and his colleagues tweaked computer similarity search functions to do it fly style. And then pitted the fly-inspired algorithms against conventional ones. And the biologically inspired code won out better at telling, like from, unlike, on an image similarity test. You know evolution figured it out, it figured out a very elegant solution to this very important problem. The report is in the journal Science. Navlaka says he and his team are looking to partner with tech companies now, in hopes of endowing machines with the time-tested problem-solving abilities of the brain. Even if it's a fruit fly brain. Shvedik Patel, a computer scientist, is working on novel sensing technologies with his team. At first, the emphasis was on energy and water usage monitoring. In order to keep track of electrical interference on a home's power line or variations in water pressure in the plumbing, they developed a new generation of smart sensors. Patel and his colleagues shifted their focus to modifying the technology for personal health monitoring after finding industrial uses for much of it. Making sense of all this noise and turning it into something useful has been difficult for us for years, and we're now applying what we've learned from that process to new areas. Our devices built in capabilities are being used by these evildoers. Listening for patterns in coughing and sneezing sounds may be done by this app with permission from the user, using the built-in microphone on most smartphones. People chatting, laughing, sneezing, and coughing are all examples of different forms of audio that we've used to build these models to attempt to understand how sound works and what its patterns are. By examining capillary fluid via the skin, this app may determine the quantity of hemoglobin in a person's blood. 
The camera on a phone can really see the coloring of the blood when you place your finger over it, and this test utilizes the camera to notify parents concerned about jaundice in newborn newborns that their children are anemic and hence their blood may be less red. Doctors who have examined a lot of newborns are familiar with the symptoms of jaundice. On a fundamental level, he's just able to figure things out. While the first time mum has no concept what jaundice can look like, is this infant sick and in need of medical attention? Although smartphone sensors are currently widely used, their uses and ramifications for our health and well-being may be considerably more extensive than we previously thought, experts believe. Shvedik Patel, a computer scientist, is working on novel sensing technologies with his team. At first, the emphasis was on energy and water usage monitoring. In order to keep track of electrical interference on a home's power line or variations in water pressure in the plumbing, they developed a new generation of smart sensors. Patel and his colleagues shifted their focus to modifying the technology for personal health monitoring after finding industrial uses for much of it. Making sense of all this noise and turning it into something useful has been difficult for us for years, and we're now applying what we've learned from that process to new areas. Our devices built in capabilities are being used by these evildoers. Listening for patterns in coughing and sneezing sounds may be done by this app with permission from the user, using the built-in microphone on most smartphones. People chatting, laughing, sneezing, and coughing are all examples of different forms of audio that we've used to build these models to attempt to understand how sound works and what its patterns are. By examining capillary fluid via the skin, this app may determine the quantity of hemoglobin in a person's blood. The camera on a phone can really see the coloring of the blood when you place your finger over it, and this test utilizes the camera to notify parents concerned about jaundice in newborn newborns that their children are anemic and hence their blood may be less red. Doctors who have examined a lot of newborns are familiar with the symptoms of jaundice. On a fundamental level, he's just able to figure things out. While the first time mum has no concept what jaundice can look like, is this infant sick and in need of medical attention? Although smartphone sensors are currently widely used, their uses and ramifications for our health and well-being may be considerably more extensive than we previously thought, experts believe. The brain is basically built from the bottom up. First, the brain builds basic circuits that are responsible for basic skills and then more complex circuits are built on top of those basic circuits as we develop more complex skills. Biologically the brain is prepared to be shaped by experience. It's expecting the experiences that a young child has to literally influence the formation of its circuitry. It's built into our biology. The interaction between genetics and experience that shapes brain architecture is embedded in the reciprocal relationship, relationship that children have when they will be adults in their lives, by that we mean, what we refer to as the serve and return nature of children's interaction when they are adult development and the impact of experience on development, not a one-way street, it's a back and forth interaction the brain is a highly integrated organ which has multiple sections that specialize in different processes, so we have parts of the brain, that are involved more in cognitive function and the other parts they are involved in the processing of emotions and parts involved in seeing and hearing, so if a child is emotionally can well put together and socially competent that will affect, more positive positive and productive learning and if a child is preoccupied with fears or anxiety or is dealing with considerable stress no matter how intellectually gifted that child might be his or her learning is gonna be impaired by that kind of emotional interference.
The brain is basically built from the bottom up. First, the brain builds basic circuits that are responsible for basic skills and then more complex circuits are built on top of those basic circuits as we develop more complex skills. Biologically, the brain is prepared to be shaped by experience. It's expecting the experiences that a young child has to literally influence the formation of its circuitry. It's built into our biology. The interaction between genetics and experience that shapes brain architecture is embedded in the reciprocal relationship, relationship that children have when they will be adults in their lives, by that we mean, what we refer to as the serve and return nature of children's interaction when they are adult development and the impact of experience on development, not a one-way street, it's a back-and-forth interaction The brain is a highly integrated organ which has multiple sections that specialize in different processes, so we have parts of the brain, that are involved more in cognitive function and the other parts they are involved in the processing of emotions and parts involved in seeing and hearing, so if a child is emotionally can well put together and socially competent that will affect, more positive positive and productive learning and if a child is preoccupied with fears or anxiety or is dealing with considerable stress no matter how intellectually gifted that child might be his or her learning is gonna be impaired by that kind of emotional interference. You can find house cats on every continent except Antarctica, but that wasn't always the case. How did cats make it across oceans and into households worldwide? The secret lies in an ancient cat DNA. Here's how cats spread across the world. It started around 10,000 years ago in what's now modern-day Turkey. DNA analysis shows this is where cats' wild ancestors likely originated. Wild cats proved to be effective rodent control for early farmers. As the agricultural revolution spread, cats joined for the ride by 2500 BC. Cats had reached Cyprus where no cats had existed before, over the next few thousand years they accompanied humans north into Bulgaria and Romania. By 800 BC cats had found their calling in Egypt, cats weren't just an object of worship here, Egyptian cats specifically became popular among other groups like the Romans and Vikings who brought cats on their ships for pest control these two groups took the feline revolution by storm helping cats spread across all of Africa Europe and Asia. By the time Europeans were sailing to the Americas, cats were common shipmates. Today one third of American homes have at least one cat that's about 93 and a half million house cats in the US alone now that they've conquered the world at human side, cats can rest easy. You can find house cats on every continent except Antarctica, but that wasn't always the case. How did cats make it across oceans and into households worldwide? The secret lies in an ancient cat DNA. Here's how cats spread across the world. It started around 10,000 years ago in what's now modern-day Turkey. DNA analysis shows this is where cats' wild ancestors likely originated. Wild cats proved to be effective rodent control for early farmers, as the agricultural revolution spread, cats joined for the ride by 2500 BC. Cats had reached Cyprus where no cats had existed before, over the next few thousand years they accompanied humans north into Bulgaria and Romania. By 800 BC cats had found their calling in Egypt, cats weren't just an object of worship here, Egyptian cats specifically became popular among other groups like the Romans and Vikings who brought cats on their ships for pest control these two groups took the feline revolution by storm helping cats spread across all of Africa Europe and Asia. By the time Europeans were sailing to the Americas, cats were common shipmates. Today one third of American homes have at least one cat that's about 93 and a half million house cats in the US alone now that they've conquered the world at human side, cats can rest easy.
In today's lecture, I'm going to talk about changes in air pollution since the middle of the last century and what has created these changes. So, by the 1950s, air pollution was very visible with frequent thick black fogs known as smogs in many large cities around the world. The main source of this pollution was from factories and it caused severe health problems. For example, a particularly severe smog in London in 1952 caused over 4,000 deaths. Obviously, something had to be done and in 1956 a Clean Air Act was introduced in Britain. This addressed the pollution from factories and the smogs soon disappeared. However, as you know, these days air pollution is still a big issue. The main difference between now and the 1950s is that you can't see it, it's invisible. Also, the main source of pollution now is from cars and lorries, and although these don't produce visible signs, this air pollution is still a significant risk to health. And one of the key factors in the rise of this type of pollution is that we have all become much more vehicle dependent. There are far more cars and lorries, trains, and planes than in the 1950s and this is now the main source of air pollution around the world. In today's lecture, I'm going to talk about changes in air pollution since the middle of the last century and what has created these changes. So, by the 1950s, air pollution was very visible with frequent thick black fogs known as smogs in many large cities around the world. The main source of this pollution was from factories and it caused severe health problems. For example, a particularly severe smog in London in 1952 caused over 4,000 deaths. Obviously, something had to be done and in 1956 a Clean Air Act was introduced in Britain. This addressed the pollution from factories and the smogs soon disappeared. However, as you know, these days air pollution is still a big issue. The main difference between now and the 1950s is that you can't see it, it's invisible. Also, the main source of pollution now is from cars and lorries, and although these don't produce visible signs, this air pollution is still a significant risk to health. And one of the key factors in the rise of this type of pollution is that we have all become much more vehicle dependent. There are far more cars and lorries, trains, and planes than in the 1950s and this is now the main source of air pollution around the world. This is Hans Krebs who in 1937 published a paper so in the sequence of chemical reactions by which energy is released in individual cells. It's called the Krebs cycle which some of you may remember from your chemistry course in high school. Krebs is a wonderful example to me of how a scientist who was determined can overcome all kinds of human obstacles. Krebs' father constantly discouraged him and told him that he had just mediocre intelligence and would never do anything important in his life as a teenager. What Krebs remembers in his memoir his father said to him you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. And later on when Krebs studied with the great biochemist Otto Warburg. Warburg also told him the same thing not saying quote but that he had only mediocre ability and would never be a great scientist and we all hear about how important it is for parents to encourage their children. But sometimes the children will go on to do great things no matter what we say to them.
This is Hans Krebs, who in 1937 published a paper so in the sequence of chemical reactions by which energy is released in individual cells. It's called the Krebs cycle which some of you may remember from your chemistry course in high school. Krebs is a wonderful example to me of how a scientist who was determined can overcome all kinds of human obstacles. Krebs' father constantly discouraged him and told him that he had just mediocre intelligence and would never do anything important in his life as a teenager. What Krebs remembers in his memoir his father said to him you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. And later on when Krebs studied with the great biochemist Otto Warburg. Warburg also told him the same thing not saying quote but that he had only mediocre ability and would never be a great scientist and we all hear about how important it is for parents to encourage their children. But sometimes the children will go on to do great things no matter what we say to them. Because certain places are unsuited for growing crops, some of the negative consequences of climate change alter agricultural productivity. Millions of Africans will be hungry in the future. Climate change will lead to a decrease in agricultural output and food production. A lack of resources makes it harder for poor countries to deal with the effects of climate change. Many people, primarily in Africa, are starving to death. There are dire consequences for the global economy as a result of climate change. The arid and hot conditions of the tropical regions of the earth make them unsuitable for food production at first. Floods and storms are made more frequent and severe as a result of climate change, which puts a strain on the world's food supply. As a result, there is a 10-17% to yearly decrease in the amount of food available. And by 2070, this tendency is expected to continue. Some African countries are expected to bear the brunt of the effects of climate change. Because certain places are unsuited for growing crops, some of the negative consequences of climate change alter agricultural productivity. Millions of Africans will be hungry in the future. Climate change will lead to a decrease in agricultural output and food production. A lack of resources makes it harder for poor countries to deal with the effects of climate change. Many people, primarily in Africa, are starving to death. There are dire consequences for the global economy as a result of climate change. The arid and hot conditions of the tropical regions of the earth make them unsuitable for food production at first. Floods and storms are made more frequent and severe as a result of climate change, which puts a strain on the world's food supply. As a result, there is a 10 to 17% yearly decrease in the amount of food available. And by 2070, this tendency is expected to continue. Some African countries are expected to bear the brunt of the effects of climate change. For next year, I want to make sure you know how to acquire a place to live. First year students were assigned a dorm and a roommate this year, but returning students will be able to pick both their roommate and their housing for the upcoming academic year. But the lottery method determines whether or not you or your roommate will be able to dwell in the apartment of your choosing. Students who have been in the school the longest are given precedence in the system. The first block of numbers is given to fourth-year students, the second block is given to third-year students, and the third block is given to second-year students like you. The sooner you make a decision, the lower the number you draw. It's a first-come, first-served situation. To select a room, you can enter either your own or the number of your prospective roommate. Second-year students will have lower numbers than first-year students if their roommate has been at the university for longer. The problem is that most of you will be sharing a room with other second-year students, and none of you will likely have a large number of friends. First and second choices may not be yours. There's no need to enter the lottery if you've already decided to live off campus. Because the North Campus dorms will be closed for repairs, there won't be as much room for students this year. 
Because of this, those of you who receive the poorest numbers in the lottery will not be able to acquire dorm space. Off-campus accommodation can be arranged through the housing office if such is the case. For next year, I want to make sure you know how to acquire a place to live. First year students were assigned a dorm and a roommate this year, but returning students will be able to pick both their roommate and their housing for the upcoming academic year. But the lottery method determines whether or not you or your roommate will be able to dwell in the apartment of your choosing. Students who have been in the school the longest are given precedence in the system. The first block of numbers is given to fourth-year students, the second block is given to third-year students, and the third block is given to second-year students like you. The sooner you make a decision, the lower the number you draw. It's a first-come, first-served situation. To select a room, you can enter either your own or the number of your prospective roommate. Second-year students will have lower numbers than first-year students if their roommate has been at the university for longer. The problem is that most of you will be sharing a room with other second year students, and none of you will likely have a large number of friends. First and second choices may not be yours. There's no need to enter the lottery if you've already decided to live off campus. Because the North Campus dorms will be closed for repairs, there won't be as much room for students this year. Because of this, those of you who receive the poorest numbers in the lottery will not be able to acquire dorm space. Off-campus accommodation can be arranged through the housing office if such is the case. Thank you so much, Mr. President, and NDTV, for this great distinction. Who you are cannot be isolated from where you come from, Malcolm Gladwell said in his book The Outliers. I moved to the United States 35 years ago and may have had wonderful success in that meritocracy. But none of it would have been possible if I hadn't had such a lovely upbringing in India. As a result, I owe India a great debt of gratitude. Now I'd want to share my three lessons with you. First and foremost, please consider yourself a lifelong learner. When we're young, we ask questions like, why is the sky blue, or why is the bird soaring so high? But, for some reason, as we get older, our curiosity fades, and if we're content with what we know, we'll atrophy. So, please keep your curiosity alive by becoming a lifelong student. Second, whatever you do, put all you have into it, your intellect, heart, and hands. I don't think of my job as a job, I think of it as a calling, a passion, and I don't mind the long hours or the difficulty since everything is a delight to me. So, whatever you do, consider it a vocation and a passion rather than a job or something transient. The third and most crucial point is to assist others in rising. Greatness comes from contributing to the future, not from holding a position. All of us in positions of power owe it to others to help them rise. As I stand here today, I see my obligations not as an honor, I see them as a task, a responsibility, and an obligation to really make it possible for those who are younger to get to the level of greatness so that they, too, might be on the platform at some point in the future. Thank you, NDTV, for this tremendous honor. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.
Thank you so much, Mr. President, and NDTV, for this great distinction. Who you are cannot be isolated from where you come from, Malcolm Gladwell said in his book The Outliers. I moved to the United States 35 years ago and may have had wonderful success in that meritocracy. But none of it would have been possible if I hadn't had such a lovely upbringing in India. As a result, I owe India a great debt of gratitude. Now I'd want to share my three lessons with you. First and foremost, please consider yourself a lifelong learner. When we're young, we ask questions like, why is the sky blue, or why is the bird soaring so high? But for some reason, as we get older, our curiosity fades, and if we're content with what we know, we'll atrophy. So, please keep your curiosity alive by becoming a lifelong student. Second, whatever you do, put all you have into it, your intellect, heart, and hands. I don't think of my job as a job, I think of it as a calling, a passion, and I don't mind the long hours or the difficulty since everything is a delight to me. So, whatever you do, consider it a vocation and a passion rather than a job or something transient. The third and most crucial point is to assist others in rising. Greatness comes from contributing to the future, not from holding a position. All of us in positions of power owe it to others to help them rise. As I stand here today, I see my obligations not as an honor, I see them as a task, a responsibility, and an obligation to really make it possible for those who are younger to get to the level of greatness so that they, too, might be on the platform at some point in the future. Thank you, NDTV, for this tremendous honor, thank you, ladies and gentlemen.